Greetings to all from Besant Women's College, Mangaluru. I, Meera Egna Quelio, Associate Professor in English, take pride in welcoming all our esteemed participants on this virtual platform to this national webinar titled Albert Camus' novel, The Plague, Absurd Life, Death, Sisyphus, Peremptory Diseases and Gods organized by the Department of English. The novel was first published in 1947. However, seven decades later, the book has become a global sensation, an undisputed pick amidst the current coronavirus pandemic and its sale skyrocketed since late January. It is the defining book, which is and seems to be the novel for now. To have a discourse on the theme of the webinar, we are indeed fortunate to have a learned scholar, Professor Patabi Rama Somayaji. Sir, on behalf of the management, principal, staff and students of Besant Women's College, Mangaluru, I extend a warm and cordial welcome to you. A warm welcome to Sri K. Devanand Pai, the Secretary of Women's National Education Society and the correspondent of the college. Welcome, sir. A cordial welcome to the principal, Dr. Satish Kumar Shetty, the IQAC coordinator, coordinator Professor Syed Kadir, the NAC director, Dr. Praveen Casey, all my colleagues and dear students. A very warm, pleasant and cordial welcome to all the enthusiastic participants on this virtual platform. We shall now begin this webinar by invoking the blessings of the Almighty. Shivarnam Chaturbhujam Prasanna Badanam Dhyaye Sarva Vigno Pashantaye Agaja Anana Padmarkam Gajam I now kindly request our principal, Dr. Satish Kumar Shetty, to address the participants. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, respected uh, Professor Padabi Somayaji, the resource person for today's program, correspondent of our college, sir. K. Devanand Pai, management member and uh, the correspondent of uh, PO College, uh, Sir Baltagade Ganesh Krishna Bhatt, the IQAC NAC coordinators, the convenience of this webinar, and my dear uh, participants. Uh, today's theme is about uh, Albert uh, Camus' The Plague, published in 1947. It's a fictional story written about the very real town of Oren in North Algeria. Many consider the, this novel to be a war allegory of uh, the French resistance in the Nazi, Nazis in the World War II, pointing out the futility of human aspirations and the inevitability of sufferings. The rest of the themes generally follow as corollaries to Camus' philosophy 
in the novel the bombonic plague is the uh, is a symbol of many things the harsh the meaningless meaningless universe the human condition or war but all of them mean suffering and death the climax occurs when the gates of war are reopened announcing to the world that the battle against the plague has been won the novel ends as a tragic comedy bernard reacts the narrator acknowledging that man can never conquer death has narrated the story of the plague in order to teach others to recognize and fight the disease he is one of the first people in oren to urge the stringent sanitation measures be taken to fight the rising epidemic and also we come across uh, uh, the information about uh, the purpose of god for the plague and we also come across uh, a, a character like uh, cotter who welcomes the plague as it reduces the rest of the population to its natural state of fear and loneliness and is and distracts the authorities from potentially arresting him cotter also runs a profitable smuggling business during the epidemic and also we come across the information about the the first two uh, major uh, plague uh, pandemics uh, uh, the black death and also we come across uh, information about the spanish flu which took the life of uh, say lakhs together 1 billion people and uh, also he speaks about uh, the absurdist philosophy and also we come across the myth of sisyphus also in the story probably to know more about this uh, we have today uh, professor patabi somayachi the professor of uh, english uh, from uh, uh, mangalore university constant college mangalore i on behalf of the management on behalf of the correspondent staff and on behalf of the participants extend a very warm and cordial welcome to him welcome to you sir, uh, to you, sir for this webinar program respected correspondent secretary of ms national education society sir k devananda pai is our uh, strength and source of inspiration i extend a very warm and cordial welcome to him for the for his gracious presence a very hearty welcome to our management member and correspondent of bezen national pu college sir i congratulate the convenience of this webinar Uh, Mrs. Uh, Prita Bandare, Ms. Mira Edna Koyla, Dr. Uh, Gautam Josna, and uh, Mr. Girish. Uh, I also extend a very warm and cordial welcome to all the staff members for the dedicated uh, and sincere service. A very warm and cordial welcome to all of them. This is a six, uh, this is our sixteenth webinar with this nineteen nineteen quiz programs. Uh, one more uh, say. fdp program and the one art competition and uh, one food competition is going to be held uh, very shortly maybe in the next week uh, a warm and cordial welcome to the iqac coordinator uh, professor said kadir nag coordinator uh, dr pravin kumar kesi for their initiative in organizing these webinars i extend a very warm and cordial welcome to all my colleagues for their support and uh, assistance in uh, quality uh, quality initiative measures Special thanks to the technical staff, Mr. Ritesh and Mr. Ravindra Murthy. Last but not the least, I extend a very warm and cordial welcome to all the participants for attending this webinar. Thank you. Have a a fruitful session ahead. Thank you, sir, for your warm and cordial welcome. From the MC desk, I now welcome the correspondent of Bazin PU College, Sri Bel Tangadi Ganesh Krishna Bhatt. Welcome, sir. I now kindly request the correspondent Shri K Devanand Pai to convey his good wishes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to apologize for the delay. My fellow member on the Governing Council, Mr. Ganesh Bhatt, the principal, Dr. Satish Kumar Shetty. the resource person professor yet patabi ramasomaya ji university college mangalore the event coordinators dr gautam josna and uh, mr girish kumar the ipsc chief mr sayed khader the hod of department of english professor pita bandari madam meera edna koelo 
the NAC coordinator, Dr. Pravin Kumar, the participants, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are dealing with an important and interesting topic in this webinar on Albert Camus's The Plague, Life, Death and so on. The plague comes to represent other sources of suffering and alienation. First and foremost is it is an allegory for the rise of Nazi Germany and the suffering that happened during World War II as a metaphor for the human condition and this absurdity of our experience. Sisyphus is the epitome of the absurd hero because he is able to recognize the absurdity of the human condition, abandon hope, find happiness in material reality, and ultimately find meaning in the struggle itself. Camus defined the absurd as the futility of a search for meaning in a comprehensible universe devoid of God or meaning. Absurdism arises out of the tension between our desire for order, meaning and happiness, and on the other hand, the indifferent natural universal refusal to provide that the central concern of the myth of Sisyphus is what Camus calls the absurd. Camus claims that there is a fundamental conflict between what we want from the universe and what we find in the universe. The plagues were water turned into blood, frogs, live, gnats, diseased livestock, boils, hail, locust, darkness for three days and killing of firstborn sons. Absurdism shares some concepts and a common theoretical template with existentialism and nihilism. The absurd refers to the conflict between the human tendency to seek inherent meaning in life and the silent answer of the universe in which a harsh truth arises that there is no inherent meaning in life. Finally, I would like to congratulate the coordinators, Dr. Gautam Josna and Mr. Girish Kumar for conducting the webinar and wish the program all the best. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My colleague, Mr. Girish Kumar, Assistant Professor in English, will now introduce our distinguished resource person, Professor Pathabi Rama Somayaj. Thank you. Good morning. I, Girish Kumar, from the Department of English, Vezant Women's College, deem it my pleasure to introduce our resource person, Professor H. Patabi Rama Somiyaj, Associate Professor, University College, Mangalore. We are extremely happy that he has accepted our invitation to enlighten all of us on the topic, Albert Camus, The Plague, Absurd Life, Death, Sisyphus, Peremptory Diseases and Gods. Sir, as a versatile personality, and great intellect. He served as a professor in English at the Center for Postgraduation Studies, Mangalagangotri, Mangalore University, and also at its branch at Madikeri for many years. At present, he is serving at University College, Hampankata, Mangalore, the constituent college of Mangalore University. He was closely associated with Professor of interest are reading and writing poetry. He is also proficient in Kannada language. While serving at Vidyodaya College, T. Narasi Pura, he had formed a poetry club for poetry lovers. One of his former students shared the information that in those days, both Kannada and English graduate students would never miss his poetry classes as they enjoyed his classes very much. 
Professor Patabi Ramasamaya Aji is well known for his scholarly lectures and has mesmerized his audience on all occasions. Sir, we too are eagerly waiting to listen to your wonderful thought provoking lecture this morning. With this short introduction uh, of a great personality, I present to you our resource person, Professor Pattabhi Rama Somaya Ji. A cordial welcome to you, sir. Thank you. Participant, kindly mute your audio and video. Questions are asked only in the chat box and resource person will answer your questions at the end of this session. Now, I request our resource person to take over. Thank you, sir. Greetings to all. It's a pleasure to be here in this esteemed college. It's also a pleasure to be speaking about my favorite author, Albert Camus, particularly his novel, The Plague. During this long lockdown, most of us are feeling blank, lost, lackadaisical. And this is on one occasion to interact. We are living through times when we see around us people wearing masks, breath and their words muffled. Dormant distances have now come up front and are now ironically renamed social distancing. What is physical distancing is now called social distancing. And we are speaking also now about what is called the new normal. Like Grand the Clerk said, or Potter the Smuggler said. In the play, a fresh start. But it's not as if, I mean, it seems to suggest that things were normal until very recently. That we have entered now into an abnormal state from which we are looking forward to a new normal. This is uh, to say the least, a misperception as far as I can see. It's not as though things were normal before. What with the farmers committing suicide, the uh, migrant workers living a hand-to-mouth existence, girls being raped, and so on, coupled with the nationalistic bluster, violence in the name of the nation, the rhetoric of war, unemployment. I mean, people thought that this is all normal. Now it was perhaps abnormal, it is abnormal and it will perhaps remain abnormal for quite some time. Unless uh, we do something about it. Though I shall be referring to all the issues um, 
in the title, I thought I would have a new title because I thought the title that is provided to you sound, sounded a little pompous and pretentious. The new title would be Camus the Lake, a Sermon of Pope. Camus, the plague, the sermon of Pope. Why? Because, briefly, many critics sometimes see it as a long sermon, not in the bad sense of the term. Some call it a fable, some call it a parable, and uh, um, many people say that this is not like the other novels. However, there is an agreement in the world of Camus readers that this is also one of his masterpieces. For example, one of his um, critics, critical admirers, Conor Cruz O'Brien calls it a masterpiece. It's appropriate to call this a sermon of hope also for the third reason, which is that the novel has within it two very important sermons by the priest, Father Penelo. A very moving Uh, sermons. And there is this Dr. Ryu, Donald Ryu, who is the narrator. Though, of course, we come to know about it, about the fact that he is the narrator only in the last section. Uh, who goes on talking about what he has seen, what he has heard, what he has read, what he has experienced, what he has been a terrible witness to. So in that sense, it is also a sermon. So a larger sermon by Dr. Ryu and enveloping two sermons by Father Penelope. Now, this is my plan. I shall be speaking of some six points. I shall begin for the benefit of those who might not have read this, or for the benefit of those who um, want to read it and for the benefit of those who might have read it long ago, uh, some excerpts. I thought of presenting a synopsis, which is not good. It's better that the author himself speaks. I shall give you some excerpts from throughout the book. The book that I have is uh, um, translated by Stuart Gilbert, who was the first one to translate it in 1948, one year after the publication of the French original. Um, the page numbers would be from this book. Um, there are different editions. Now, of course, you know, 
there are uh, many new editions coming out is selling in lakhs and lakhs of copies and even several new prestigious publishers are i mean uh, contemplating bringing out uh, new translations for the next year and so on anyway from this book i shall give you some excerpts the second point i shall try to dwell upon at some length would be the philosophy of the absurd and i shall here also draw your attention to um, Camus' own words from this book called uh, The Myth of Sisyphus. The third point I shall be discussing would be the circumstances and the background uh, that is uh, from Oran, where Camus was at the time when he was, he had started writing it. In 1941, to France, 1942, when he went over to France to take part in the um, resistance movement. Um, the fourth point would be introducing you to the major characters. As you will see later on, when I come to this point, I shall just give you a list of characters, major and minor. That's not my point. When I say major characters, I have something else in mind. Um, all that you will see later. Three characters actually. And the next point, the uh, fifth one, would be why read. The plague. And lastly, I shall try to briefly conclude it. So, what I should first do now is to uh, book the plague. This is this is a book in five. This is a novel in five books. Uh, Five parts. And this happens, as you know, in Oran, an Algerian coastal town. And this is what the uh, part one, first chapter has to say. What is more exceptional in our town is the difficulty one may experience there in dying. Difficulty, perhaps, is not the right word. Discomfort would come nearer. Being ill is never agreeable. But there are towns which stand by you, so to speak, when you are sick, in which you can, after a fashion, let yourself go. An invalid needs small attentions. He likes to have something to rely upon. And that's natural enough. But at Oran, the violent extremes of temperature, the exigencies of business, the uninspiring surroundings, the sudden nightfalls, and the very nature of its pleasures calls for good health. An invalid feels out of it here, out of it there. This is the uh, first chapter. The second one, uh, second chapter actually, on page 15 here. This is the outbreak of the plague. On the fourth day, the rats began to come out and die in batches. From basements, cellars, and sewers, they emerged in long, wavering files into the light of day, fade helplessly then did a sort of pirouette and fell dead at the feet of the horrified onlookers. Next, I shall go to page 51. <coughs> this is 
this is uh, Dr. Castle and Dr. Liu speaking. There, Castle said, I don't agree with you. The basilisk is a queer one, is what uh, uh, Dr. Liu had said. There, Castle said, I don't agree with you. These little groups always have an air of originality, but at bottom, it's always the same thing. That's your theory, anyhow. Actually, of course, we know next to nothing on the subject. I should move over to part two, which is on page 63 and 64. The sense of being abandoned, which might in time have given char characters a finer temper, began, however, by sapping them to the point of futility. A burst of sunshine was enough to make them seem delighted with the world, while rainy days gave a dark cast to their faces and their mood. A few weeks before, they had been free of this observed subservience to weather. I shall move over to page 68. One of the cafes had the brilliant idea of putting up a slogan. The best protection against infection is a bottle of good wine, which confirmed an already prevalent opinion that alcohol is a safeguard against infectious disease. Then 69, 70. The rest of the story to Grant's thinking, Grant is the municipal clerk, you get married, you go on loving a bit longer, you work, and you work so hard that it makes you forget to love. As the head of the office where Grand was employed hadn't kept his promise of giving him a promotion and a good salary, Jean, that was uh, his fiancée, his wife actually, too had to work outside. She also had to work outside. Owing to largely fatigue, he gradually lost grip of himself, had less and less to say, and failed to keep alive the feeling in his wife that she was loved. An overworked husband, poverty, the gradual loss of hope in a better future, silent evenings at home, probably Jean had suffered, and yet she had stayed. Of course, one may often suffer a long time without knowing it. Then one day, she left him. Naturally, she hadn't gone alone. <clears throat> Next, I'll take you to page 38. Towards the end of the month, the ecclesiastical authorities in our town resolved to battle against the plague with weapons appropriate to them, and organized a week of prayer. I'll take you to page uh, 81. This is uh, the um, sermon, first sermon, during this week of prayer, towards the end of the week of prayer by Father Penelo, the most, uh, um, for the devout, the most uh, moving uh, account of uh, God's relationship to man and man's relationship and the human's relationship to God. Uh, this is what he says. My brothers, See him there, that angel of the pestilence, comely Lucifer, shining like evil's very self, 
He is hovering above your roofs with his great spear in his right hand, poised to strike, while his left hand is stretched towards one or the other of your houses. No earthly power, nay, not even mark me well, the wanted might of human science can avail you to avert the hand of hand that had that is stretched towards you and winnowed like corn on the blood-stained threshing floor of suffering you will be cast away with the chef. You fondly imagined it was enough to visit God on Sundays. I should draw your attention to the fact that Dr. Ryu has to say this. See, um, uh, Quran has a beautiful beach and Sundays people uh, had a choice to go either to the church or to the beach and most people chose the beach. Anyway, uh, you believed some brief formalities, some bendings of knees would recompense him well, well enough for your criminal indifference. But God is not mocked. These brief encounters could not sate the fierce hunger of his love. He wished to see you longer and more often. That is his manner of loving. And indeed, it's the only manner of loving. I'll take you to page 98. Charo had some comments on the sermon preached by Penelo. At the beginning of a pestilence, and when it ends, there is always a propensity for rhetoric. <coughs> I should advert to this. <coughs> you see, when in the course of his sermon, Father Penelo says, You have sinned, kneel before God. He says, I think what he meant was metaphorical, that is surrender to God. And immediately the hall that was packed, even the compound was also packed. People slowly get out of their seats and literally kneel down. At the beginning of the so moved and terrified, and we are also told the moment they are out of the church, influenced by Father Penelo's sermon, they go in search of Nostradamus, go in search of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, old books that recommend all kinds of superstitions and so on. They scar the municipal library for old books, uh, for religious remedies and so on anyway. So at the beginning of the pestilence, of a pestilence, and when it ends, there is always a propensity for rhetoric. In the first case, habits have not yet been lost. In the second, they are returning. It's in the thick of a calamity that one gets hardened to the truth. In other words, to silence. I'll take you to page 106. This is Taro and Ryu. My question is this, said Taro. Why do you yourself so, so, so much devotion, considering you don't believe in God? That is, Dr. Ryu is a very conscientious uh, doctor. Uh, uh, let me, I, 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 might, I might come back to the point, but I might forget. Let's remember that he is doctor in the literal sense, but not necessarily in the literal sense. He's a very efficient doctor, hardworking, compassionate, uh, a fatherly figure, and he works generally in the poor quarters, uh, and uh, he is now working in a uh, makeshift hospital, which is a school converted into a hospital, uh, and uh, he comes, he takes only four hours rest uh, during the nights, uh, he, and uh, uh, at the height of, uh, um, of uh, the Pestilence, uh, his mother, who is always waiting 
for him to come back, uh, notices that his hands were trembling and he was sweating all over. Uh, so that is the devotion with which he works. I say, I mean, uh, in, in other words, I mean, at the beginning, when the rat, when he noticed the rat on the staircase uh, or in front of his uh, clinic, uh, he had ignored it because uh, he was in in a hurry to send his wife to a sanatorium to the mountains, um, and uh, it was later that there was uh, this uh, sealing down of the uh, town gates and uh, he was separated from his wife uh, uh, because of that and this separation in exile is one of the dominant themes of this uh, of this um, um, novel so for example we have at least two people here one is uh, dr Gu himself the other one is rembert the journalist who has his uh, wife not really a wife but wife um, in paris uh, whom he uh, tries in as many ways as possible to go and uh, I mean break the laws here and go and meet her. Not because he's a coward, because he had fought in the Spanish Civil War, uh, but because uh, he wants to um, be happy and uh, be happy with his uh, wife. Uh, so, um, so there are two people at least. Uh, uh, there are many, but these are two uh, obvious examples. So my question is this, said Tarot, why do you yourself show such devotion considering you don't believe in God? I mean, the point is that it's only a, a great believer uh, who would be so uh, human. Uh, I suspect uh, you answer, your answer may help me, uh, help me to mine. His face in the shadow, you said that he had already had answered that if he believed in an all-powerful God, he would cease curing the sick and leave that to him. But no one in the world believed in a God of that sort. No, not even Penelope. You can see, I mean, this Dr. Liu is, I mean, not only poetic, graphic, but also ironic. I shall take you to part three, which is on page 147. Maybe I shall not read it. The point is this, that uh, there are too many dead bodies, truckloads, and uh, uh, the ambulances make frequent trips carrying these dead bodies to the burial ground. And, uh, uh, and as the numbers increase, uh, the authorities have a different plan they dump all the dead bodies into one pit. And uh, at the beginning, there is one pit for men, one pit for women. Um, the layers and layers of uh, lime and so many dead bodies into one pit. And eventually, this also does not suffice and therefore they have to um, uh, dump uh, men and women together into the same pit. But that also does not suffice and therefore, one of the, I mean, porters there uh, has a suggestion which the authorities think is very uh, nice, which is that uh, instead of uh, uh, burying the dead, the cremating is better. And uh, uh, the crematorium, crematorium was a little far away, and uh, uh, near this burial ground, there was an abandoned railway station, and there was also an abandoned train. Uh, and uh, they decided to, uh, and this was, uh, um, and from there, they decided to have a new train route laid to the crematorium and thought of transporting the dead bodies through this train um, to the crematorium. And uh, um, P 
people were not allowed even before uh, even when the dead bodies were taken to the burial ground relatives were not allowed in the initial stages four or five relatives were allowed later only until the gate later on not at all and now uh, crematorium nobody is uh, you can see the dead body uh, so uh, the trains were carrying dead bodies however some some young people i mean uh, somehow uh, sneaked out and got on top of rocks and uh, on small hillocks and showered flowers hoping that the flowers will fall on the dead bodies that belong to their family so the <coughs> trains carried dead bodies and flowers but the problem was that there was because of this um uh, uh, crematorium the uh, whole town was uh, was writhing in the foul smelling cloud of smoke that hung over it uh, so uh, there was uh, there were protests by the people and therefore the authorities decided to build a high wall um, between the crematorium and the city and uh, uh, later on it's only when there is a high wind that they began to sense this foul smell otherwise they were uh, relatively uh, okay uh, let let me take you to part 4 this is page 156 this is about dr ryu before the plague he was welcomed as a savior he was willing to make them right with a couple of pills or an injection now on the contrary he came accompanied by soldiers and they had to hammer on the door with rifle butts before the family would open it because people thought that it would be better to die with the plague patient at home than abandon him or her to uh, the isolation wards uh, where they couldn't see them and they are sure to die uh, and so on. Uh, and therefore the uh, uh, the at first the police officers accompanied dr view but later on the military military also because uh, some people who have been identified who have been suspected of uh, having contracted the plague or having in contact with patients who had died of plague uh, had to be tested and therefore these rifle butts <clears throat> i shall take you to page 159 and 60 this is about cotter the smuggler see before uh, the outbreak of the plague he was suspected of some criminal activity and therefore he was hunted which hunted by the police and uh, uh, he was uh, living a very lonely life avoiding uh, the police he was feeling very lonely but now what cotter had some months previously been looking for in public places luxury and the lavish life the frenzied orgies he had dreamt of without being able to procure them because he was not rich these were now the quest of a whole populace so the prices soared inevitably never had so much money been squandered and while bare necessities were often lacking never had so much been spent on superfluities Uh, now it is uh, the scotter who can be seen in i mean uh, luxurious restaurants and spending lavishly he has made a lot of money i'll take it to page 175 this is about the child this is a, i mean you should read it to see the horror of uh, death right in front of your eyes and the doctor as i said is a terrible witness in many cases particularly in the case of 
in the case of this child and in the case of tarot uh, and in the case of uh, grand who is against all law recovers uh, you see dr ryu uh, at their bed until uh, the end uh, from bit and this is the child i shall not read the whole thing you have to read it to, for the horror of this death that uh, kamu can so picturesquely de depict from between the inflamed eyelids big tears welled up and trickled down the sunken leaden headed the leaden hued cheeks when the spasm had passed utterly exhausted tensing his thin legs and arms on which within 48 hours the flesh had wasted to the bone the child lay flat wrecked on the tumbled bed in grotesque parody of crucifixion the word crucifixion grotesque parody of crucifixion i refer to dr rius irony he is a non believer non believer not in the sense tomo also is a, is a is a non believer not in the sense that he is worried about uh, the presence of absence of god as tomo says uh, in myth of sisyphus he is worried about the silence of god not the absence of god i shall take you to page 177 and uh, during this last hours of the child crying dying a most tragic and horrific death father penelo is also there and he can't control himself he goes down to the goes down on his knees and prays to god god lord save this child um come doctor doctor he began Ryu swung round on him fiercely. After the child is dead, and uh, uh, and uh, Doctor Ryu is very upset, and uh, he is uh, walking out, and followed by Father uh, Pendelo. Come, Doctor, he is trying to pacify him. Ryu swung swung round on him fiercely. This is the only time you see him. in a very fear smooth but that child anyhow was innocent and you know it as well as i do when he was speaking about sinners you say this is a little child um i should take you to page 185 <laughs> Okay, this is Father Penelo's second uh, uh, sermon. I shall be brief. If the chronicles of the, I mean, he gives an example. If the chroniclers of the Black Death at Marseille were to be trusted, only four of the eighty-one monks in the Mercy Monastery survived, survived the epidemic. Of these four, three took to flight. one stayed on that monk who stayed on by himself my brothers each one of us must be the one who stays and this time when father penlo is speaking uh, there is a very thin crowd so then uh, page 191 92 uh, this is uh, Penelo himself catches the plague and dies out out of this, and he um, he refuses to um, be treated. But then, uh, when uh, things go very bad, he uh, submits to all examinations that uh, Doctor Liu conducts. Doctor Liu does not want to uh, leave him to himself, leave him to God's mercy. In fact, uh, the, the why. father penelo refuses to uh, do this is the his second sermon he say he had told dr ryu 
was supposed to be a rough draft of a long essay that he was contemplating to write, which is, uh, should a priest consult a doctor? So, and in the hospital, uh, he had demanded that he should hold a crucifix in his hand and holding it tightly, he rise. And uh, it was not very sure whether he would, he had many symptoms of plague, but it was not very sure. He dies of what is called a doubtful case. Um, I think uh, I shall, uh, since time I'm told is running out, I shall just refer you to some pages which are about this. I could have read them. Uh, this is uh, page 202 in part four where Tarot speaks about his father. I should tell you a little about this. Tarot's father, an attorney, um, who never much traveled by train, except once in a year uh, to a nearby farmhouse that he had, had a bedside book, which was the railway timetable, which he knew by heart, and whatever However complicated the, um, the routes that you ask him, he had a ready answer. And uh, the Entero also had, had entered into this game, had, he had enjoyed it. Uh, the father was a very genial man. But then uh, one day he invites the son to the um, uh, court where he was going to argue a case against a criminal and uh, he sees, Tarot sees that uh, his father who appeared genial at home has now become so stiff and he was with utmost vehemence demanding capital punishment to a criminal, to a supposed criminal who was a young man who was pleading guilty to a small crime that he had committed. And uh, this is when, I mean, uh, for the first time, Taro, uh, Taro snaps his relationship with his father. He came from a well-to-do family, but then he abandoned it and uh, goes on, uh, uh, goes away because he does not like this death penalty. He does not like violence. Um, he goes to, goes into poverty, into exile, and he joins uh, various uh, um, uh, movements um, uh, all over Europe, as he said, as he says. Um, and uh, he was participating in those protest meetings and so on, which. I mean, were against uh, authoritarian, fascist uh, regimes. He had a response because he felt all along that the side from which he was fighting the fascists also had an ideology which, which uh, uh, talked about uh, um, murder and violence as uh, necessary for a better future so as to end all murders. Um, so he leaves that and finally lands in Oran and he says um, when he, I mean this is what he confesses later to uh, Dr. Ryu, uh, there is an intimate conversation between them, that uh, he had killed thousands himself without knowing it, by participating in these protests and so on. By being on the side of those who protested against fascism, he had also killed thousands. And uh, so uh, um, he has come here to chronicle and he says, this is most important, he says, I came to Oran as the plague myself. And this plague is within every one of us, he says. One might have not 
literally physically killed somebody but this plague germ is something every one of us is carrying and i am the plague myself he had said um and uh, the page 205 also speaks about whatever i just now mentioned is uh, leading towards the left and participation in the left protest meetings and so on uh and the, on page 207 and 209 uh, you see dr ryu and dr uh, and taro in intimate conversation he wants to share his uh, views and uh, there is one important part of this conversation which is that taro says he does not believe in god but then he wants to be a saint dr ryu says i don't want to be a saint i just want to be a man and uh, uh, the answer by taro is i am less ambitious what is meant is that it is easier to be a saint than to be a man uh, then after this intimate conversation uh, on page uh, 210 uh, ryu and taro take a swim in the uh, moonlit night in the sea uh, that is a great moment uh, you see in many of his writings uh, in many of kumo's writings the sea the sun uh, the moonlight the evenings uh, the uh, pleasant wind the rocks in the seas the nile rocks in the seas all these are so vivid and uh, kumo himself loud swimming and football uh, very much so uh, they swim and that shows the intimacy and this is part 5 uh, where uh, taru um, uh, speaks about uh, has written in his uh, diary about uh, ryu's mother he keeps looking at her what is her and he feels that she is like his own mother who is now dead um who had suffered a lot but had somehow managed the somehow managed is uh, uh, is what uh, these uh, older women characters in kamu uh, generally speak of uh, uh, in the final analysis uh, we will uh, manage anything is uh, what they say kamu's kamu's mother herself was a sharp woman uh, a widowed sharp woman uh, uh, looking after a huge family living in great poverty kamu was born into great poverty uh, in fact uh, i should also mention this uh, dr ryu is i shall come to this point later dr ryu is uh, actually kamu himself and um, when uh, uh, this uh, journalist grand asks dr ryu um, i mean uh, what made you all do all this dr ryu says where did you learn all this this compassion all this where did you learn all this he says poverty his immediate pat answer is poverty uh, so uh, and uh, this mother for example um, tells dr ryu that taro now is diagnosed with uh, severe plague but he should not be sent into the isolation ward that that they should keep him at home this would be a criminal offense dr ryu himself has to see to it that uh, all plague afflicted patients are in the icu ward but then uh, the mother pleads and the doctor agrees and the doctor and the mother in turn in turns uh, look after taro until the moment of his death and uh, taro you can see during his last moments is staring intently into the face of the mother and the mother a little disturbed uh, she is at the bed uh, standing by the side of the bed all the time uh, the mother a little disturbed turns off the bed lamp uh, and uh, when he dies early in the morning with uh, dim light showing she could see that he had that smile and that intent gaze fixed upon uh, ryu's mother still on his face um and i shall refer you also to page uh, 240 uh, 
uh, this is the meeting uh, of uh, Rangold, the journalist, uh, at the railway station in Oran of his fancy girl. This is a great reunion. Uh, Mr. Rambert actually had an opportunity to uh, smuggle himself out. He hadn't gone out. He had stayed back with Dr. Ryu because he had said that if I, uh, because if I went, it would be a shame on my part. And uh, my um, wife also might think that it's a shame on me that I abandon this responsibility and uh, come away. And then uh, I shall refer you to page 246, where uh, we come to know that it is uh, um, Dr. Yu, who is the narrator, and what kind of narrator he is. Um, I shall leave, it, uh, leave that at that. The second next point I wanted to speak about was uh, the observed. Um, this also I shall do by quickly referring to a few pages, a uh, few excerpts from the um, um, myth of Sisyphus. You see, uh, I shall be brief. The, the absurd means simply this to come on. The human need for meaning and the unreasonable silence of the world. Uh, and the absurd, look at this. The absurd person is someone who has seen through the ridiculous repetitions of daily life, the gray routine, and the stifling calendar of existence, rising, tram, four hours in the office or factory, meal, tram, four hours of work, meal, sleep, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, according to the same rhythm. This path is easily followed most of the time. But one day, the why arises, and everything begins in that weariness pinched with amazement. Suddenly, the absurd person sees through this routine, and the chain of daily gestures is broken. Now everything begins to seem pointless and comical. See, I began by referring to the masked men and women, I mean, and the empty buses or the half populated buses and so on. It's also like a pantomime. <coughs> and it has a comic, I mean, and we look with our masks on, uh, we look like uh, alien creatures. Uh, there is that comic aspect to this. But then, um, act, as, uh, as uh, Sisyphus knows this, and as Dr. Ryu in the plague knows this, life is a never-ending defeat. But the fight is on. So there is this, I mean, uh, uh, there is this uh, comic aspect, there is this tragic aspect to the uh, absurd. But he says, everything considered, the determined soul, whether it is comical or whether it is awoken to the absurd, whether, it is com whether the absurd is comical or tragic, everything considered, a determined soul will always manage. This, this, this struggle implies a total absence of hope, which has nothing to do with this despair. This is absence of hope, not despair. A continual rejection, which must not be confused with renunciation. And a continual, continuous dissatisfaction, which must not be compared to mature unrest. Uh, I shall draw your attention to a metaphor which reminds us of um, Dr. Ryu uh, and uh, Sisyphus and uh, Rambert, the journalist. I see this, uh, Camus calls this recognition of the 
absurd and this rejection, a rebellion. The question that arises is whether this rebellion is only metaphorical, because uh, the uh, at the end of it, it appears as if someone is saying, go on living. Living is uh, the only answer. Um, And in the concentration camp during the Second World War, a certain person called Primo Levi had uh, faced an intolerable temptation to pray. And this is what his diary has to say. This is Primo Levi. This reminds us, as I said, of Dr. Ryu, of uh, Sisyphus, of uh, uh, Amber, the journalist, naked and compressed among my naked companions with my index card in hand, I was waiting to file past the commission that with one glance would decide whether I should immediately go into the gas chamber or was instead strong enough to go on working. Those who can work will work on, otherwise they will be sent to the gas chamber. For one instant, so this is a life and death moment. For one instant, I felt the need to ask for help and asylum to pray. Then despite my anguish, the equanimity prevailed. You do not change the rules of the game at the end of the match, nor when you are losing. A prayer under these conditions would have not only been observed, what rights could I claim and from whom? But blasphemous. Not only absurd, but blasphemous, obscene, laden with the greatest impiety of which a non-believer is capable. I rejected the temptation. I knew that otherwise I were to otherwise I knew that otherwise were I to survive, I would have to be ashamed of it throughout my life. Um, I shall also just uh, read for you the first sentence of this. Uh, a chapter called Absurdity and Suicide. The first question Kamu takes up is the question of suicide because if life is meaningless, the next one answer could be suicide. Um, and he makes very distinct, many distinctions about suicide. I mean, people committing suicide uh, and uh, people committing philosophical and theological suicide, even after, I mean, um, um, recognizing the absurd and so on. Um, uh, this is how it begins. There is but only one, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth saving amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. This is what he has to say. Um, and, uh, uh, at the end of this um, book, in the chapter called An Absurd Reasoning, uh, he says this. Thus, this is the conclusion he provides. Come on. Thus I draw from the absurd three consequences which are my revolt, my freedom, and my passion. The mere, by the mere activity of consciousness, I transform into a rule of life what was an invitation to death, and I refuse to I, and I refuse suicide. Um, see, he speaks about uh, different kinds of suicides um, while talking about um, in, in this uh, book about suicide. I said, uh, even the person who has had enough and wants to commit suicide, uh, commits suicide either to teach a lesson to someone or out of some some uh, bravado of heroism. Uh, in either case, this is uh, an affirmation of life and not of death. And he discusses the question of uh, philosophical suicide with regard to um, uh, starting with uh, um, uh, Dostoevsky. Um, he, I mean, he uh, discusses Dostoevsky in great detail. Uh, 
Dostoevsky, according to him, is perhaps the first one to recognize the absurd. And he felt, and, and Dostoevsky says, um, if there is no God, everything is permissible. And his quest is to look for what depths and what heights a man could reach. He speaks about, for, for example, uh, in uh, the crime and punishment, the Ubermensch, um, which culminated, as we saw during the 20th century, in a person like Hitler. Um, but then, uh, um, uh, Dostoevsky seems to uh, answer by saying that suicide is perhaps the way out of this absurdity. And uh, uh, there is this theologian, existentialist uh, Christian theolo uh, theologian called Soren Kierkegaard, who, like uh, Martin Heidegger later, spoke of life as a process of angst, anxiety. Uh, but then, uh, and, and so he had also recognized this absurd, says Camus, but then uh, towards the end, being the Christian that he is, um, he says life is not just immanent, it is also transcendent. And uh, Camus calls it philosophical suicide. Uh, I'm supposed to speak for another 15 to 20 minutes. That is, uh, it's not 35. Yeah, you may have uh, okay, I mean, this, uh, with regard to this absurd, um, it was Martin Heidegger who said that uh, he spoke about what is called the, our thrownness into being. It's not as if we chose a being. And he also famously said, Martin Heidegger, German philosopher, that one is ripe to die as soon as one is born. And he also famously said, whatever might or might not happen tomorrow, one thing is sure to happen, which is that we are all going to die. So, I mean, I should uh, dwell a little on uh, the Sartre and Camus. Uh, because uh, sometimes uh, um, Camus is called an existentialist, a nomenclature, a label which uh, Camus vehemently opposed. Um, Sartre is, of course, considered a founder, uh, existentialist philosopher, novelist, and so on. Though, of course, um, uh, Derrida calls him uh, no philosopher. And uh, not just Derrida, many people think that uh, his philosophy, Sartre's philosophy is uh, um, not uh, all that philosophical, though of course he was as an intellectual, a very tall personality uh, and as a writer. Um, see, I mean, um, the difference is this. Um, the uh, since, uh, I mean, we are thrown into being and we can be what we could be, live or die, whatever, um, by our choices. So it is our choices that make what we are. Um, and uh, you have uh, no choice not to choose. Everything that we do, now that you're listening to me, it's, it's your choice. Um, you need not have. Um, so everything that we do is determined upon the choices that we make and we have no escape from the choices that we make and the choices that we make, make us into what we are. Um, bring the transformations that we want to bring in our lives, uh, in our selves, in our personalities. Uh, and uh, uh, Sartre famously said, existence precedes essence. That is, what we are in essence is something that happens later. Existence precedes it. Um, uh, Martin Heidegger spoke of a category called uh, inauthenticity. He also spoke of a category called the Das Man, that is, they. Last man is they. For example, uh, someone might tell you, 
uh, oh, what is wrong with you? Why can't you be like them? That kind of thing. Um, See, so this is, I mean, and uh, Sartre spoke of a concept called bad faith, uh, which is, uh, uh, Sartre was a, a devoted uh, uh, disciple of uh, Martin Heidegger when he wrote uh, Being and Nothingness. Um, he speaks of bad faith, which is in authenticity as uh, Heidegger concept. A bad faith is simply this. That is, for example, if I were to give you an example, uh, I'm a teacher, some of you are teachers. Um, if you say a teacher is a teacher, like a stone is a stone, that's bad faith. Because, yes, you are a teacher, yes, or a student, or a mother, or a father, yes. But then, supposing you're ill, and you go for a consultation with a doctor, yet you're not a teacher, you're a patient. Supposing you're traveling, no, you're not a teacher, you're a passenger. Uh, so, I mean, it's not as though we are rocks and stones as personalities. Um, so, to believe that, what can I do, I'm only a teacher, is bad faith. I mean, many people say this, I mean, what can I do? So this, this, is, this is called bad faith. However, the difference between Camus and Sartre regarding uh, uh, the philosophy of the absurd and existentialism, which have many things in common, is this. Camus does not hark back to the lost, glorious past. He does not wallow in nostalgia. He does not also hark back to a promised land of the future. He knows that death is the end of everything. And his choice is life and not death. He says, life will never choose death. Life chooses life and not death. Um, but, uh, the, but Sartre, speaking about existentialism and choices, says, um, uh, and later on, Sartre became the existentialist Marxist. Um, he believed that uh, what choices we make today will determine a promised land for the future generations. And uh, communism also had some, communism had a similar, has a similar ideology, you see. Um, and what incidentally happened was, you see, Gamu was the first one to join the Communist Party in 1936-37, and he was the first one also to leave it uh, in 1938 or so, because uh, he was arguing in favor of in favor of the Algerian Arabs. Gamu was. Gamu belonged to Algeria. Algeria had 70 million, seven, seven million uh, Arabs and uh, nine lakh uh, uh, very poor settler, it's a settler colony, French uh, citizens of which uh, Camus was one, Camus family was one. I mean, uh, because he pleaded that France was being very brutal uh, towards the Arabs, the way the Germans were being brutal towards, um, towards uh, uh, the French, um, uh, he, I mean, uh, because uh, France and Russia were allies during war, during that part of the war, Second World War, I mean, uh, the Marxists played down uh, the question of Algeria, and so Camus walked out of it. So, I mean, uh, he did not uh, endorse uh, violence and death in any form, um, and more importantly, as uh, Camus somewhere, uh, Camus says it in, um, the myth of Sisyphus, what he, what he hates is not so much the violence, but the uh, uh, institutions of violence, the ideology of violence. Not, I mean, if you kill somebody accidentally, that is another matter. But if you have an ideology which propounds violence, which propounds death in the hope, in the, by promising a better future, uh, that is something that he would uh, reject. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, instead of extending our life into a non-existent promised land of the future, that as uh, Sartre or Marxists speak of, Homo speaks about uh, quantifying our life, not qualifying. You see, uh, uh, there is a saying, uh, it's better to live three days as a, uh, as a, as a valiant person rather than uh, as a rat for 100 years. Uh, this is not a question of uh, uh, three years, values, and 100 years of uh, 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 covered days. The question is, how, how you quantify it? I mean, um, uh, the ultimate justification is life. Um, uh, there is no heroism. As you can see from Dr. Ryu, there is, uh, and, and as Doc, uh, Dr. Ryu himself puts it, uh, being man is uh, more difficult than being heroic and so on. So, uh, and uh, the third point is uh, uh, about the background. I should just put it this way. I should not go into details. I have some notes here. I, I can't, uh, I can't, uh, since I don't have time, I can't uh, go into details about it. But I will recommend you to go into details wherever it's available, including in that book of Honor Lewis O'Brien. In 1941, um, you see, Camus is a, is a, is a wonder uh, for uh, a variety of reasons. He was writing simultaneously three books, Caligula, a play, a book of philosophy, The Myth of Sisyphus, and his most, most, most famous novel, The Outsider, simultaneously. And it was complete by 1941. He was born in 1913, remember. And uh, in 1927, he had the first attack of tuberculosis. And tuberculosis was uh, the, I mean, uh, the, uh, in the medical field, uh, medic medicine, was, medical field was uh, very primitive and cruel in its treatment of tuberculosis during those times. Now things have changed. And so he lived with death all through his life, uh, not in the metaphorical sense of the term, but in the physical sense of the term. And uh, uh, by compl after completing uh, the, the books were published, these uh, Myth of Sisyphus and The Stranger uh, were published in 1942. It was complete already by 1941. And he had started writing The Plague, though it was published, of course, much later in 1947 because uh, he had many other things to do during this whole time. He was, of course, working upon it. Uh, he was in Quran. Um, Camus was in Quran when he was writing this uh, uh, novel, The Plague, uh, which is the Algerian's coastal city, and uh, doing odd jobs. He, didn't, he, was, he was living through poverty. Okay? It's only after he, he, his book sold uh, later on uh, and he became popular that he uh, lived a better life. Um, but he never forgot his uh, poverty. Um, that's uh, the great thing about it. Uh, okay, I mean, from Quran, uh, one day, one fine day, he reads in the newspapers that uh, in France, uh, France has been occupied. So he had uh, gone there to, uh, um, to join the uh, Second World War. Uh, uh, join the army, but because of his health, that is tuberculosis, he was not allowed. And so he came back. And now uh, when he read in the newspapers that uh, uh, in France, uh, several uh, prominent personalities whom Camus knew uh, had been uh, guillotined, have, have been uh, killed uh, by the occupying uh, not the German army, <coughs> he feels that uh, he should go to France. <coughs> he goes to France in 1942, organizes a, a um, I mean, uh, takes lead of a group um, called Combat, and in 1943, uh, he begins a, a band underground publication called Combat, uh, of which he was the editor. And uh, for all practical purposes, he was supposed to be the 
proofreader in the prestigious Gallimard Press in Paris, which published uh, uh, his books. Um, Gallimard is a very prestigious publishing house. It, it would publish rubbish. Uh, uh, and the person who recommended uh, Camus' books to Gallimard Press was Camus' own, uh, the, the author Andre Marlowe, no, Malro, whom uh, Camus greatly admired. Uh, so uh, uh, he brings out this book. I should at least read this uh, one. And uh, after the uh, war was over, when the war was over, um, 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 Camus was, I mean, Camus brought out in the month of August. Uh, uh, 1944, the uh, uh, the first open edition of uh, Combat, of which one could now see in the masthead um, Camus' name as editor. Until then, it was an underground band publication. Uh, two things I should mention. One is uh, whenever uh, uh, the and uh, I said he was working as a proofreader at Gallimard Press. And then after the working hours, he would, in spite of his very bad health, bicycle all the way to a far off village where he lived in a farm house, farm in a village farm, from where he brought out uh, this underground publication called Combat. He did it incessantly, uh, uh, not worrying about his uh, health. He also, uh, I mean, um, had staged plays, protests, all underground activities. Uh, and when uh, the war was over, when he was interviewed, uh, this is uh, uh, Camus' editor, a prestigious editor of uh, uh, what is called the Pleiade edition of Camus' works, called uh, Roger Quilliot, who said, um, uh, I mean, when he was interviewed after the World War, uh, Camus did not like the veteran style. He did not want to pose as a war veteran. No doubt from a, a decent reticence, because Camus was a decent reticent man. And secondly, because of a fidelity to a memory. Because I mean, you can't blabber about that horror. And uh, uh, the fidelity to that memory is evident uh, most uh, vividly in this book, The Plague. The, the occupation years of France is uh, so beautifully brought out in this book, and you can see that. And uh, when um, the first open edition of uh, uh, the combat uh, came out, the editorial written by Camus had uh, these lines in it which is uh, very important. Paris fires all its bullets into the August night. The war is over, now the celebration. In this vast setting of stone and water, all around this river, heavy with history, the barricades of liber liberty have risen once more. Shall I read this again? The barricades of liberty have risen once more barricades of liberty. Once more, justice has to be bought with the blood of men. Uh, okay, I mean, uh, I said uh, I would uh, talk about the characters, um, major characters. Uh, you know by now, uh, Dr. Bernard Liu, Jean Taru, Raymond Rambert, uh, Rambert the journalist, uh, Joseph Grant, the clerk, Porter, the puppeteer, uh, Father Penelo, uh, and so on. And then there are minor characters, I shall not mention their names. Uh, but that is not what is in my, uh, is my, that's not my point. The point is, um, the Blake presents first three characters. One is Dr. Donald Ryu who is throughout the novel. He is the narrator. 
Uh, I mean, it is uh, one very vibrant character. I have said a few things about him, and therefore, uh, I don't uh, need to elaborate upon this because of the constraints of time. And the second one is the Oran Sea Town. That is the character uh, which is under lockdown. I mean, this lockdown, how the uh, city, I mean, was, is, and uh, and uh, how its moods change, how people's attitudes change, how the whole city itself, the cityscape itself undergoes a transformation, makes around the city into a, um, into a character. I said this because to Kamu, his homeland and his mother, his motherland and his mother are very dear. For him, uh, there is no Algeria without uh, um, without the sea, without the wind, without the rocks and all that. So, um, and the third one is, this is more important, the plague itself is a character here. Looming large from about the second or third chapter of the book till the end of the book. And the speciality about this is, this uh, plague as character, uh, as Kamu configures it, has this, uh, I mean, um, this remarkable speciality about it, which is that, um, I mean, he does not, I said a little while ago, that Kamu said he hated, he hated not so much violence as much as the institutions of violence, the ideology of violence. You see, he does not squarely put his blame on God or the gods on earth, the Ubermensch, uh, Hitler, and so on. Uh, in fact, he depersonalizes this God. This plague is this depersonalized God. <coughs> um, and uh, this depersonalization helps him to dwell on the plague and the specificities of the plague rather than an abstraction called God or uh, some, um, I mean, some person wielding. No, this is a this is a whole uh, ideological apparatus. This an this a hegemony, and uh, how it uh, impacts the people, uh, how it impacts a society, how a whole machinery of, I mean, the uh, for example, the term state terror, is the term first used by Kamu. Uh, now, of course, everyone uses it, state terrorism. Um, uh, Kamu was the first one to use it. So he was, I mean, uh, he shows the effects, impact of this terror. So he is, and, and Kamu has, as, as he has always said, he is on the side of the victim, not on the side of the victor. And, uh, uh, he, and uh, just as he said in the combat editorial, now there are, there are the barricades of liberty and uh, life has to be one with uh, the blood of men. Similarly, at the end of the plague, he says, I mean, he says it's not, uh, Dr. Liu says it's not victory. It is just doing what you want to do. And uh, it's not uh, to be thanked because uh, if you say two plus two is four, I mean, uh, you don't thank a mathematics teacher for teaching you two plus two is four. You might thank him for being the mathematics teacher, but not uh, for telling you that two plus two is four. So in that sense, the plague also is an important character. And uh, the other question I wanted to ask is, uh, why read the plague? Of course, the whole world is now reading the plague. In Japan, who know the terrors of war, the Second World War, some 15 million copies were sold uh, during the first days of the outbreak of... Um, uh, and uh, publishers are frantically trying to keep up uh, with the demand and several uh, publishers, as I earlier mentioned, are trying to commission new translations which would be ready only next year. So that is the kind of demand that it has. Uh, the point is, uh, at least two things are important here. Um, one is its language. And the second one is its narrator. Uh, uh, as a student of literature and of the arts, uh, this is uh, why I would want to read the plague. Uh, uh, and um, uh, with regard to um, 
is it Camus was very deeply influenced by Kafka, uh, particularly by the trial. And the trial is uh, one most wonderful uh, work of the 20th century. Um, and uh, uh, plague, the plague is somewhat very similar, influenced perhaps very deeply, because it is uh, not only poetic, um, but also hermeneutical. That is, uh, I mean, when Dr. Yu looks at something, he tries to look at it from as many angles as possible, and all of them appear to be uh, true. Uh, so, I mean, and, and, and most, uh, most of the times they're contradictory. So uh, there is uh, not one aspect to which things could be looked at is what Kafka has taught and Kamu has practiced here. Uh, so that is the language. And uh, as uh, one of his um, uh, critics, I think it is Patrick McCarthy, if I remember correctly, um, uh, who said that uh, the beauty about the plague is that uh, the uh, horrific death and devastation, the picturesque presentation of the pathos of death and devastation that uh, Camus presents here is intertwined with a very crisp and poetic and hermeneutical language. Camus is a great stylist. And, uh, and that is what makes this a very great read. Uh, 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 and uh, I shall inc inc incidentally mention, for example, uh, this grand who has been writing uh, for ages together a novel uh, and uh, correcting it and correcting it. He has not gone beyond the first sentence, grand, about uh, the eloped, uh, his eloped wife, Jean. Uh, the, uh, and when uh, grand himself uh, uh, takes to uh, plague and uh, as Dr. Ryu says, against all rules he survives. Before his, uh, he, he was sure, of, sure to die, and he, his last wish, his uh, 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 fervent wish is that Dr. Ryu should, in front of his eyes, throw these papers into the uh, fire. The papers, because the, the sentence might be one, but there are so many footnotes suggesting the alternatives, why it has been chosen, why it has not been chosen, and what could have been better, and all that footnotes, it, has, it is uh, some 50, 60 pages. So he throws it into the fire, and when he survives the next day, he says, I'll make a fresh start, I'll write the novel fresh, fresh again. So there is this, I mean, uh, refining language. I mean, paying attention to language that appears in the, in, 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 inside the novel as one of the motives. Then the narrator, um, I'm coming towards the end. Uh, the narrator is uh, not the omniscient narrator. Uh, most of, uh, and not even a, a documentary writer. Uh, though there are chronicles, diaries, and other things that are consulted here, there is a clinical precision also because there is a doctor who is a, uh, a doctor uh, who cannot, uh, I mean, bluster. Uh, doctors have to be more clinical than, um, I mean, uh, rhetoricians. So uh, he's a chronicler. Uh, and that lends to this book a, uh, a, a great, greater poignancy than it would otherwise have been. And uh, uh, so, I mean, there is this clinical objectivity, if, if I can, if I may be permitted to use this term called objectivity within quotation marks, there is this clinical objectivity to this narrator that is uh, Ryu. Um, I'm coming to the end. I shall not elaborate. Uh, I could have gone on, uh, gone on and on. That is uh, uh, unfortunately my habit. Uh, but I shall end, conclude with the last paragraph of um, the plague. And indeed, this is this was published in 1947. And indeed, as he listened to the cries of joy rising from the town. You remember that such joy is always imperiled. He knew what those jubilant crowds did not know, but could have learned from books, that the plague bacillus never dies or disappears for food, that it can lie dormant for years and years in furniture and in linen chests, that it bites its time in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, and bookshelves, and that 
and that perhaps the day would come when for the pain and enlightenment enlightening of men it roused up roused roused up its rights again and sent them forth to die in a happy city thank you for your patience and for listening thank you sir for your thank engaging you. and insightful session and now dr gautam jyotsna assistant professor in english will now initiate a discussion by taking up the question and answer session uh, thank you sir thank you for uh, that wonderful wonderful session really provoking and uh, had had kamu been here i'm i'm sure that he would be glad uh i i i always wanted to ask you about uh, the forces of uh, contradictory elements you know appearing throughout the uh, works of uh, albert camus i mean uh, his unquenchable desire to uh, swim in the moonlit ocean the heat of algeria his uh, fascination for uh, desert solitude beautiful women romantic adventures at the same time i mean uh, speak for uh, spirit in camus uh, novel at the same time um, his own close encounter with the death holocaust hitler uh, nuclear annihilation uh, the threat of uh, end of the world of course these dark matters do appear throughout this novel so uh, so even the shadows of death do uh, take place uh, in his uh, lyrical essays as well so can you please uh, talk us through this sort of paradox so oh, this is not a paradox the hmm. question is important the, the question that you raised is good but not a paradox at least uh, as uh, camus sees it and as many of the existentialists also see it because this uh, passion for life is uh, is present in even the humblest of the person the humblest of the person also chooses life over death uh, and um, and in uh, in their own ways in their own different ways they they seek the happiness of life in their own different ways this is life but uh, to use a term that is used by um, martin heidegger who was the guru for all these people including derrida um, there is this facticity called death you can't avert your eyes and say there is no death that's what i Uh, began my lecture with you can't just say things were normal before corona arrived i mean there was so much of death and destruction poverty all that and if you turn your eyes away from this it's your problem if you stare into what is in front of you you see death staring at you it's waiting for you to finish up fast and you can't ignore it so i mean the camus answer is i mean if death is waiting there i'll entertain it entertain it in both the senses of the term that is i mean uh, I, i'll live life so passionately that you should feel fidgety and second is uh, i mean uh, a time comes when uh, you will take me away i will come along so uh, it's not as if it is a contradiction in fact we don't notice it we also live through all this and it's only as kamu said in metaphysics during those rare moments when we lose a uh, a dear friend of ours a dear colleague of ours a, a dear family member of ours uh, that we suddenly realize for a moment or for a, a short duration that we were living with death all these all this while <coughs> but then uh, somehow we learn to either manage as kamu puts it or our type our eyes away from this and uh, look at this for example if things were normal uh, during the early days of corona why were so many thousands and thousands of people like the rats in oran i mean uh, i mean trundling along uh, the roads uh, looking for a way out uh, for a home and so on i mean it's not as if they were not there until then they were there we did not look at them we did not speak for them we did not recognize them it was there as a facticity and and a writer an artist uh, is greater uh, is, is a great 
in proportion to the ability to see not just the happiness uh, of life but also the tragedy that is built into life uh, because i mean uh, there are lesser writers who i mean uh, theatrically celebrate uh, life as one uh, joyous festival uh, i mean uh, that is partially true but that is not the whole truth there is also the other side of the coin which is that suddenly i mean uh, before our own death comes we come across several deaths i mean when it happens uh, at a distant place it is just a number uh, when it happens to uh, close uh, people closer to us it is uh, it's much more uh, intimate uh, this this is also one way we avoid you see for example in the plague there is this reference to uh, the authorities like our authorities also see first they were issuing bulletins uh, uh, weekly of the number of deaths um, uh, due to the plague and at the climax uh, of uh, the plague the roughly the deaths would be uh, 900 1000 1200 and so on and the authorities thought it fit and uh, uh, prudent to announce daily bulletins because uh, if you say uh, 90 today 90 or 100 today uh, 100 is uh, less than 1000 right? so people feel comfort that's one way of assuaging uh, so, uh, also avoiding the fact of what is the fact of the matter so uh, there is no great writer there is no great artist uh, not just writer no great artist who is uh, alert both to the the little and great joys of life but also to the grave tragedies that lurk underneath and uh, and uh, manifest themselves at unexpected moments in front of us to teach us a lesson that uh, life is not what you thought it was that there is a relook at life that is necessary so i think uh, that would be my answer we have a yeah. we have a question here from one of the participant mm. excellent presentation revisiting uh, today's pandemic or uh, reflection of those years the outcome is full of tragedy and sadness this could be minimized if stakeholders especially health bureaucrats politicians and communities participate responsibly through policies through policy formulation execution and efficient follow up your thoughts sir about present scenario where will get the conclusion where will we get the conclusion from i don't know i mean my i don't have an answer to uh, such a profound question uh, i am not a sooth sayer um, i can only refer you back to the plague and uh, uh, these are i mean uh, uh, a little more or a little less always present these uh, these horrors of life are always present with us and uh, um, as kamu uh, put said unless we gear up to Uh, change ourselves to meet the circumstances as they come, and hold on to life. Uh, there is no other answer. I don't see. Uh, uh, I don't think I can answer anything more to this. About labor. Okay. Uh, Bhutan, am I right? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the very first line of uh, Camus' uh, notoriously famous novel begins with uh, wonderful, disturbing, profoundly disturbing lines: "Maman died today, or yesterday, I do not know." I mean, with that line, Camus sort of uh, vacuum cleaned the idea of uh, language in its entirety, and uh, all sort of uh, myths revolving around the term "mother." I mean, signify a mother uh, was shattered, deconstructed. and uh, we are really glad that uh, you 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 came over here you had uh, spent your valuable time and uh, i am this I'm, this point that you made uh, you know that i have written elaborately about it in kannada 
this was a lecture that I gave on Camus during 2013, 100th uh, uh, birth anniversary of Camus at Damangari University, where I have spoken at length about this. Uh, the, I should just add to what you said, uh, two sentences. I'm not happy with the word notoriously famous. Uh, other things are fine. Um, it was uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, the older contemporary of uh, Camus. Uh, Camus was just a 27, 28 year old young man when he published The Outsider and became world famous. And he got his Nobel Prize in when he was 44, the youngest. Um, uh, it was uh, Sartre, was a much older man and, a, and already an established person who said, um, the novel exists as uh, uh, word objects, word objects, uh, not language, but word objects. Um, and he also said, language exists here as a silence. He was referring to the stranger, particularly the first part of the outside. That is uh, that uh, language exists here as a silence. This is not me, this is Sartre himself. The, uh, the other one is um, um, Roland Barthes, the structuralist turned post-structuralist who uh, also popularized uh, um, semiotics uh, during the 1980s. He called it degree zero writing, degree zero writing. That is, I mean, you see, this is because, I mean, um, as um, it, it began with Martin Heidegger, who is the guru of all these uh, structuralists and post-structuralists and even these authors, uh, who first said, you see, I mean, we are drawn into language. I'm sorry, we are, we are born into a language. Uh, that is, we are, we are born to a language. It's not as if we create a language. We are born to a language. And when we speak, it is the language that speaks. This is uh, Sozur also who said, first structuralist Sozur who said, uh, it is not we who speak language, it is language speaking to us. So, um, unless you clear the ground, this uh, word for uh, Martin Heidegger is very dear, this uh, clearing, unless you clear the ground for language, you will not be able to make any sense. You will be saying what the others are saying. So, uh, Kamu was a great master at uh, the use of language, as we saw in the question, of, in the in the case of this play, also, if I had time, I would have spoken about the stranger. I have uh, a lot and lot, lot to speak about the stranger, um, but uh, that is the kind of language that you see there. Yes. So, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, what? Really yeah, uh, now Professor uh, Preeta Bandari shall take over. Good afternoon. It is said that gratitude is the fairest blossom which springs from the soul. On behalf of the IQAC and the Department of English, I deem it a privilege to propose the ode of thanks on this occasion. We are extremely grateful to our resource person, Professor Pattabiram Somiaji, for having consented to share his invaluable knowledge on Albert Camus, The Plague. Sir, it was indeed a very insightful presentation, which I'm sure has created a great impact and on all the listeners. Thank you very much, sir. My heartfelt gratitude to Sri K. Devanand Pai, Secretary of WNES and correspondent of Bezan Women's College for the great support always given to us. My thanks to Sri Ganesh Krishnabhat, correspondent of Besant PU College for the encouragement given. I extend my sincere gratitude to our principal, Dr. Satish Kumar Shetty, for the unstinted support given to us at all times. My sincere appreciation and heartfelt thanks to all our participants for the overwhelming response and participation. I sincerely thank the IQSC coordinator, Professor Syed Kader, and NAC coordinator, Dr. Pravin Kesi, for the encouragement given. I'm grateful to all my colleagues for the support and best wishes bestowed on us. 
My special thanks to all the members of our department for the efforts taken to organize this webinar. We are grateful to Mr. Ritesh for the exceptional technical support extended to us. We are also thankful to Mr. Ravindra Murthy for the technical help. Thank you one and all.